2001-2002 I remember the night of December 21, 2001 vividly like a fresh cut wound. I saw in a dream a monstrous blackbird swerving making mystical patterns in the air on an orange firelit desert as if the loneliness and boredom of my life was on an edge of explosion i woke up from my bed and sauntered down the corridor of my apartment through vaporous darkness unaware of others and the chill freezing in the midnight breeze i walked from room to room imitating the motions of the blackbird in my dream in search of something i did not know then i saw the refrigerator standing in the corner of the dining hall faintly illuminated by streaks of bluish light it shone like an ice man whose image i had conjured up in childhood listening to the mysteries of the yeti roving among himalayan peaks i proceeded towards it pulled by an unseen magnetic force i opened its door half hoping to find the mysteries of my life preserved inside its cooling chambers in colorful bottles of glass i opened the door and saw a haze of white light bathed in thick clouds of steam pouring inside the apartment filling it up in no time there was nothing inside the freezer the trays and the walls looking maniacally sterilized as one did in a morgue and they were lying there prisonly empty all of a sudden the fluorescence the shafts of cold steam and the buzz of the electric motor became one resonating with the universe and the motions of my soul to tell me i was still swimming in my dream 2 on december 31 2001 i had given into my restlessness i did not go with my friends to the oberoi grand There was a sickening buzz drumming in my soul. On such nights, I traveled through the darkness-filled back streets, walking through the alleyways towards River Hugli from the Chitranjan Avenue. These uh, fog-drenched lanes, full of hordes of every variety, drunks, drug pushers, smart pimps, lemonade vendors. mustachioed sellers of imported condoms cigarettes and chewing gums abandoned lovers and unemployed poets police constables and emaciated foremen from closed down mills look almost like a city lost underneath an ocean did i forget where i had to go in the city far away somewhere i could sense drums playing a thunderous tune lights forming a spectacle of holy war the bourgeoisie and the rich from the provinces dirtying their branded shirts and shining cars with wine and tomato curry in the evening i had stealthily visited the minaret of restlessness the terrace of a modest quarter on the premises of the national library where many years back i had lost my virginity clumsily to a girl whose face i no longer could remember i came back to this place many a time to make desperate attempts to recollect that starlit spring night when i had first tasted the darkness of a woman's body walking and walking and walking aimlessly tirelessly and without any respite through the oceanic pathways i reached a cobblestone paved road lit by a cocktail of bluish and greenish light its sources beyond my vision the sky looked bitumen black dotted with crimson stars the road was lined with monuments and cathedrals 
made out of black and white stone like the ones i had seen in european paintings i halted like a modern car on radial tires not by the scene of this strange road that i sighted but by the view of a burned down tram car that was rotting on its sidewalk darkness oozing through its window panels the corpses of its driver ticket collectors and a few dwarfish passengers frozen and reduced to skeletons the pain of death imprinted on each face could i hear wails in the distance of men and women being cast finally i got distracted by an advertisement on a glittering billboard rising atop the dome of a cathedral it showed the view of a castle on the foaming sunny seaside surrounded by plantations of green and the happy face of a beaming woman juxtaposed on this wonderful landscape it read desire chain of hotels for the love lord the chivalrous and the courageous come back to your home crafted in luxury and style 3 2002 arrived with a bang a devastating headache and a few painkillers i met somebody that year after a very long time but i must tell you the background first onjona the candy her father owned a milk candies factory and she brought candies to school for us once every week fell in love with ronjon the giraffe for he was the tallest boy in school a full inch taller than mr abraham our pt sir who was 5 feet 11 inches tall on the autumn equinox of the year we were in class 9 anjuna had told me in great detail about those moments when she had fallen in love with ronjon he was playing cricket in the ground adjoining our school against a local team he was batting when anjuna was crossing the road on her sports cycle barely out of the school gate ronjon was taking stance to face a fresh over from a lanky chap their eyes met for a brief spell the delivery immediately after was a good length ball that was dispatched to the extra cover boundary ronjon had timed the ball most sweetly as they say leaning on his legs like a crafty warrior swinging his bat in the air like an avenging sword anjuna clapped in awe ronjon looked at her questioningly anjuna had smiled in glad appreciation ronjon was clean bowled the very next ball three runs short of a half century it was then that anjuna felt wind blowing inside her body she threw her cycle on the pavement along with her school bag ran towards ronjon who was returning to a makeshift pavilion dejected and depressed with life on the edge of the cricket ground soon anjuna and the candy and ronjon the giraffe were locked in each other's arms for as long as 150 seconds as per eyewitness account there was a hush in town that spread like wild fire about the public display of affection by a pair of high school wayward rich kids this became impossible to contain in spite of the best intervention by the school authorities and two powerful sets of parents the story in a very different and exaggerated form had converted itself into a local legend needless to say the cricket match was abandoned soon thereafter because of the commotion and riot that the event had created anjuna the candy and ronjon the giraffe went steady for the next 10 years dreaming and working towards a future life that they called new life meanwhile anjuna had completed her masters in english and joined her family business Ronjon had completed his masters in mechanical engineering and MBA in finance and went on to join an investment banking company. 
Both of them made rapid progress in their respective fields. Their love bloomed more and more with each passing day, quite contrary to what a few onlookers had predicted. Then something happened all of a sudden. The year after the Babri Masjid was demolished, Ranjun was in Cochin for eight long months on work. While in Cochin, he cut himself off from Anjana gradually and all his old friends and society circles to emerge fully married to a dark, short and petite Bharatanatyam dancer with exquisite eyes. Anjana had visited Cochin twice in this time span in search of Ranjun for his letters and calls had almost stopped only to return without being able to meet him even once. Ranjun re-entered the society circles with his new wife, brushing off his long-standing love affair with one sweep. Inexplicably, Ranjun left investment banking and shifted to core engineering. He invented some kind of a gadget that was to become crucial to the carburetor of modern cars. He set up a factory as an ancillary to car plants and minted money left, right and centre. In the next three years, Anjuna fought blinding battles in her soul. She was almost reduced to a vegetable for some time. She found no happiness in living, wealth or the usual comforts and achievements in life. Then one night, she dreamt of a strange hotel, a majestic stone building on a distant island made of white sand and blue trees where winds found a home to shelter lonely souls. She saw faces in this dream, faces shattered by oceans of infinite silence, strangely smiling at each other, immersed in the sea, of those winds that blew in the spaces of this strange hotel. And thus was born the idea of desire chain of hotels. This cured Anjuna the Candy the grueling toil of making the hotels a success. I was far away from all this as they were happening, caught up with the battles of my own life. I came to know about them much later. 4. In 2002, during the monsoon, on seashore, flanked by small mountains, I met Anjunanda Kandy, looking at the horizon. She was in a resonant trance with the oscillations of the universe in rain. And she looked so beautiful that I felt like touching her to see if she was real. When we met, we embraced each other like long-lost brother and sister. There was no melodrama in it. There was a deep and tense fountain of affection that bound us. My readers may find this hard to believe as I find it too. But it is true that there was nothing sexual in that embrace. As I remember it so clear, full of the soft touch of her glowing skin, the warmth of her hold and the candor of her surrender to a comrade of the past. So many things happened one after the other. She took me by the hand to her hotel. She showed me each and every room. She introduced me to the staff and occupants. She took me to the games room the library, the dining hall, the poetry room, the meadows leading up to the sea, the corridors, the kitchen, the attic, and finally the garden. Shadowed by a canopy of trees and carpeted with a thick layer of misty grass. Everywhere we went, she asked me to inhale the wind as deeply as I could and feel its scent as intensely as I could. The hotel from north to south and from east to west was entrapped in the vortex of a slowly moving wind very similar to the initial pacing of a leopard. And for the people, she implored me to look at their faces as hard as I could. She showed me the suite where she lived. It had clouds in it. All the furniture was made out of clouds. I did as I was told. At last, we sat down on a wooden bench in our garden and we had a long conversation over coffee. 
I told her something that was hanging on my mind for a long time. You living in a hotel suite, whereas you should be living in a sprawling bungalow. Don't you feel disoriented living here like a recluse? Anjuna replied calmly, looking into my eyes. The hotel business is all I have. My parents are dead. I'm not married. Yes, in a sense, I'm a lonely person. I find solace in work that brings me closer to more lonely people. I don't dream anymore. Yet, I love to amass wealth out of proportion. Is that bad, Sandy? We did not talk for a few moments. I was curious to know what kind of a life Anjuna led in reality. She suddenly said, I met Ranjun three years back at a social do. He was in such pain and agony. Her marriage to Sondarya did not work. They have not separated, of course, I don't know why. I asked her, intrigued, what happened after that? There was a half smile on her face. Sandy, life is a great leveler in many ways. Ranjun comes to me nowadays once in two months, stays with me for two days. To put it bluntly, he's made a mistress out of me. Two days of isolated luxury, interesting conversation and out-of-the-world sex. You know, after these two days, I feel like a speck of dirt more humiliated than when he returned from Cochin with a South Indian wife. I don't know why I gave in. I prompted her. I looked at her clearly. She had mellowed. She looked like a pale moon on an afternoon sky. Why? As I told you, Sandy, I don't know. When I found Ronjon unhappy after so many years, a flame of hope was ignited in my soul. At least till he made it clear it was not possible for him to leave his wife. I guess his sticking to his wife has something to do with his anxiety of losing his property and wealth. Well, I don't care anymore. I can't do without him, as I feel worthless in his presence now. Is it true that if you love somebody dearly, you end up reflecting the state of that person's soul? I fear I'm going to be devastated once again. After a gap, she said, Sandy, Ranjun is happy now. I am told so is Sondarya. Only I am not happy anymore. I had nothing to say to Anjana the candy. I left soon after eating a sumptuous meal. Two years later, Anjana suddenly died in sleep, happy, smiling, the newspapers reported. The news shocked me, as if I had got up one morning to find myself without my arms by my sides. A few months later, I was fed with another piece of news. This too, received an hour-by-hour hour coverage by the media. Ranjun had successfully inherited the desired chain of hotels. After maneuvering through a complex matrix of legal battles, Anjuna in her will had decided it to be so. Somewhere deep within, I felt I had a duty to confront Ranjun the giraffe, which I did not. This was the reason I took such a long time in telling this story. 5. Years later, I told this story to my wife one night and asked her the three questions that have baffled me about it from the start. Why did Ranjun marry Sondarya in such haste? Why was he unhappy with Sondarya? And why would Anjana the candy give her hotels to Ranjun? She shared with me her point of view. It threw some light that I was not too happy. I have left it at that.